Hi everyone, this is Snail Verma. In this presentation, I will walk you through several characteristics of the MLPerf training benchmark suit. Artificial intelligence is transforming multiple industries, but for it to reach its full potential, we still need faster hardware and software. Benchmarks such as SPEC and TPC were critical for improvements in the systems that run existing workloads. Similar benchmarks targeted for AI workloads are needed for AI transformation. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. There are two parts to deep learning, training and inference. What we have initially is an untrained neural network model. During training, we take this untrained model and train it on the training data set. The model will learn and tune the weights accordingly. After reaching a certain accuracy, the weights can then be stored. And this trained model can be used to make predictions. This is known as inference. Therefore, inference cannot happen without training. And training being compute intensive happens mostly in the data centers, while inference generally happens on the edge devices. The importance of training hardware is much more in today's world. This is due to the availability of big data for training. The desire for attaining superior quality of results by leveraging big data requires more resources and compute power. As a result, industries are racing to develop new specialized hardware for accelerating machine learning workloads. Although most companies can take advantage of modern hardware to train their models, there is still a debate on sound benchmarks and metrics to compare the performance under the deep learning workloads. In this talk, we'll focus mainly on the benchmarks. There are a lot of benchmarks proposed for deep learning in the past. A few benchmarks are Fathom, Dawnbench, DeepBench, TensorFlow CNN benchmarks, Facebook's AI performance evaluation platform, and as I said, there are a lot more. Most of these benchmarks were focused only on one domain, commonly image classification. Since each one can use a different benchmark to evaluate their system, one cannot compare their system with others. In order to solve these problems, MLPerf was founded. It is created by people from Google, Intel, Baidu, as well as researchers from educational institutions, including Harvard, Stanford, and UC Berkeley. MLPerf is meant to accelerate improvements in machine learning system performance. MLPerf organization came up with these benchmarks in their version 0.5 release. They reflect different areas of machine learning that are important to the commercial and research communities and where datasets and models are publicly available. These benchmarks are summarized here. This table is about the reference implementation where the first column is the framework in which the neural net model is made available. The model name is provided in the second column and the last column constitutes the reference owners. MLPerf doubts Don Ben's time to accuracy metric. The threshold for accuracy can be generalized as quality target. Here we show the quality targets used by MLPerf for evaluating the submissions. The reference time over these benchmarks are shown in this graph. As we can see, the time taken by the benchmarks is huge on the reference machine, which contains the NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU. And there is a big variation among them. For example, recommendation takes less than an hour, while image classification benchmark takes more than six days. In this presentation, we would try to answer several questions related to the MLPerf benchmark suit. Like, from a hardware's perspective, how different are the MLPerf benchmarks from the prior deep learning benchmarks? How different are the MLPerf benchmarks from each other? How much speed up can end-to-end -end benchmarks like MLPerf deliver by exploiting reduced precision computation using tensor cores? How well does the training performance scale with increasing the number of GPUs? Finally, we would also look at CPU, GPU, and interconnect utilization trends and reveal some insights. 
Now I will talk about our methodology. We ran experiments on the GPU submissions of version 0.5 of the MLPower training benchmark. Specifically, we used optimized code from Google submission, which utilized eight V100s and NVIDIA's DGX1 submissions. Note that there were no GPU submissions for reinforcement learning benchmark and Deep Speech 2 was excluded from the submissions. To easily refer to the benchmarks, we use aliases, which consists of the benchmark suite name appended with the model used, followed by the framework in which the submission was made. For example, Google submitted its optimized ResNet 50 model for image classification tasks in TensorFlow framework. On the other hand, NVIDIA submitted the same in MXNet. Rest of the submissions were made by NVIDIA using PyTorch framework. From prior benchmarks, we picked two benchmarks, DawnBench and DeepBench. For DawnBench, we use highly optimized submissions, one for image classification task on C410 dataset and another for question answering tasks on SWAR. DeepBench essentially benchmarks the underlying neural network operations on the hardware such as dense matrix multiplication, convolution, recurrent layer, and communication. Note that these are not end-to-end -end benchmarks, but just a collection of primitive kernels written in CUDA. We use various multi-GPU system configurations for experimentation. Let's focus on the GPUs. C4140 in configuration KNM consists of GPUs that are packaged in SXM2 mezzanine form factor and they are the ones that are connected using NVIDIA's proprietary NVLink interconnect. Other than that, only DSS 8440 system can simultaneously make use of up to eight GPUs. We will revisit the system topologies in the end of the presentation, so we need not worry about them right now. Let's start by analyzing the benchmarks. We performed principal component analysis on eight workload characteristics and visualized the distribution of the targeted ML benchmarks in the workload space. This analysis helps us to understand how similar and different these benchmarks are. The left figure highlights the differences. PC1 is dominated by GPU memory footprint. This reflects that Deep bench and on bench are working on relatively smaller datasets and they cannot stress GPU memory as much as MLPerf benchmarks can. On the PC2 axis, MLPerf benchmarks have a shorter span mainly because they are optimized end-to-end -end applications having a stable flop throughput while more diversity exists in the other benchmarks. The right side showcases the intrasuit diversity of the MLPerf benchmarks. Also, each benchmark extends the coverage such that the envelope encloses the prior benchmarks. Next, we present a roofline model for a Tesla V100 GPU and the machine learning workloads we study. The vertical axis represents the compute capability that is expressed usually in the number of floating point operations per second, while the horizontal axis denotes the arithmetic intensity in flops per byte. Memory bound workloads have a lower arithmetic intensity. Hence, the performance is limited by the memory bandwidth, which corresponds to the slope of the slant lines. Compute bound workloads have high enough arithmetic intensity so that their performance is limited by the computational resources as shown by the horizontal lines. MLPerf benchmarks are seen to be more optimized than deep bench kernels, while the two dawn bench workloads show arithmetic intensity and throughput on an even higher side. Moreover, all the workloads are found to be memory bound. This implies that we should dedicate more resources to memory interface for a well-balanced deep learning system. Many prior studies have shown the importance of mixed precision training. Similarly, here we see that MLPerf benchmarks can exploit NVIDIA tensor cores to provide a speed up of 1.5 to 3.3x 
This tra can translate into more than five hours of training, even when using eight V100 GPUs. Now we will look at the scalability of the benchmarks. Ideally, performance speed up of using two GPUs, four GPUs, and eight GPUs over one GPU should be 2x, 4x, and 8x respectively. We observe that these three benchmarks scale reasonably well with the number of GPUs. For example, the SSD benchmark shows a speed up of 1.94x moving from one to two GPUs, a speed up of 3.72x moving from one to four GPUs, and a speed up of 7.28x moving from one to eight GPUs. On the other hand, for NCF, Increasing the number of GPUs beyond two is not rewarding enough. We believe the small size of data set mobile lens 20 million causes this behavior. Small data set limits the maximum batch size, which as a result, restricts the scalability of the benchmark. The other two benchmarks, mask RCNN and transformer show medium scalability. Such heterogeneity in scalability can be used to schedule the ML tasks intelligently. For scheduling these seven tasks on a cluster with four GPUs, a naive scheme would schedule the task one by one, each using all four GPUs. However, an optimal schedule would potentially try to schedule the highly scalable benchmarks on four GPUs, some on two GPUs, and some only on one GPU. This can provide hours of savings in terms of the total training time. It is worth mentioning that this performance gain is without any effort in optimizing the software or adding any costly hardware. Now I will present the observations on system level utilization measurements. This will help us understand the impact of running deep learning training workloads and system requirements for the different models. Following few experiments ran on the C4140K. So just to remind everyone, this system had enveloping connections in between and a PCIe switch. The average CPU usage when training on one, two, and four GPU is shown here. The average CPU utilization includes the operating system usage as well as that used by the user programs. In general, as we double the number of GPUs used to run the workloads, the CPU utilization roughly doubles. This trend indicates that the CPU must have an adequate performance to keep all GPU busy. Otherwise, it will become a bottleneck during the run. ResNet 50 models are shown to have higher CPU utilization because compared to other workloads, they require CPU to perform more packaging and post-processing on the data. Moreover, the data set used by these benchmarks is significantly bigger, around 300 GB, compared to data sets for other benchmarks. Another interesting finding is that DRQA, although running on a single GPU, shows the highest CPU usage. But unfortunately, this benchmark also shows least GPU utilization among all the workloads, which indicates that a major part of the computation is performed on the CPU. Because we sum the utilization of every GPU that is used during the runtime, single dual and quad GPU run have a maximum utilization of 100, 200, and 400 percent respectively. A general trend observed is that per GPU utilization slightly increases moving from one to two GPUs and slightly decreases moving from two to four GPUs. However, note that for NCF benchmark, as we increase the number of GPUs from two to four, the per GPU utilization decreases significantly. This observation agrees with our previous statement that due to the limited scope of increase in the batch size for this workload, it is unable to utilize GPUs efficiently. Now we will look at the performance impact by the interconnection bus. Usually a GPU is connected to the CPU using 16 PCIe three lanes. This setup can provide 16 Gbps unidirectional bandwidth. A high-end Intel Xeon may have up to 48 lanes of PCIe 3, which are then allocated to various devices. With this constraint, each GPU on a four GPU system may only be assigned eight PCIe 3 lanes. 
for some applications like gaming, this PCIe 3 setup can provide plenty of bandwidth. However, this much bandwidth may not be optimal for deep learning training. Apart from CPU to GPU communication, PCI 3 bus can be used for GPU to GPU communication for a multi GPU system. However, NVIDIA found this inefficient and hence developed their own proprietary and willing interconnect. A Tesla V100 GPU in SXM2 form factor has six NVLink lanes and thus is capable of transferring data with a theoretical unidirectional bandwidth of 150 GBPX. Note that both the graphs are plotted in log scale along the y-axis. We can see that the data transfer rate over NVLink bus increases as we add more GPUs for the run. Deep Bend's reduction benchmark and MLPOF's NCF benchmark use the highest bandwidth of the NVLink. This suggests that the data exchanges between GPUs for these benchmarks are very intensive. Similarly, the utilization of PCIe bus increases as we add more GPUs, which is expected. To reduce the training time, it is becoming increasingly common to scale deep learning training across multiple GPUs. There are multiple ways in which GPUs can be connected within a system. Primarily, there are two options. One using a PCIe-based interconnect, which may include PCIe switches, and another using NVLink. Using MLPerf, we conduct a performance evaluation of five different four GPU platforms, each of them with a unique GPU interconnect topology. In the illustrations, the green arrow represents NVLink, black arrow represents UPI, and blue arrow represents PCIe lanes. Two of the five servers, M and K configuration of C4140, include high-speed NVLink interconnect. The remaining three systems use PCIe-based interconnects. C4140B uses a 96-lane PCIe switch that allows for four GPUs to be hosted in a single PCIe domain where it can perform GPU direct peer-to-peer -peer between the GPUs using the PCIe switch. This peer-to-peer -peer communication is not feasible in the other two platforms. In T640, two GPUs are hosted per CPU and in R940XA, each GPU is hosted directly using the PCI lanes of the CPU. This graph illustrates the impact of GPU interconnect topology on deep learning training times. As expected, due to lack of GPU direct peer-to-peer -peer communication between any two GPUs, the T640 and R940XA take the longest time to train all the MLPerf models. Conversely, the two servers that use NVLink interconnect, the C4140M and K systems, show the best training times across all the MLPerf models. To summarize, in this work, we presented a detailed characterization of the MLPerf benchmarks and showcased interesting system level trends. We contrasted the MLPerf benchmarks against DeepBench and DawnBench, as well as highlighted MLPerf's intra-suit diversity. We showcase the variability in scaling efficiency of the MLP benchmarks, which can be exploited by intelligent schedulers to save training time. We also demonstrated the importance of hardware support for reduced precision arithmetic. Additionally, we provided evidence for the need for adequately powerful CPUs and high bandwidth interconnects for a well-balanced deep learning training system. In conclusion, I would like to say that MLPerf is an awesome benchmark suit they are continuously evolving. For example, they fixed the dataset issue for NCF benchmark that we found in our experiments in a recent release. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to answering your questions in the live session on Monday.